Hi besties! My name is Angie, this is my channel, maybe I'll read today. Well, here we are, with a new vlog. And this vlog is especially exciting to me, uh, because it will be my first endeavor into the Vampire Chronicles by Anne Rice. I have been watching the show, I have been diagnosed with the brain rot, and I just want to learn more about these characters. I have the complete Vampire Chronicles on my Kobo, as you can see here. And in this vlog, we're gonna be focusing on the first three or four books, depending on how long it takes me. And the great thing about having the series in my Kobo is that I can literally take it anywhere. I can read it in the dark, in bed. I can read it at work. I can read it on the train. I can read it on a plane, um, which I didn't do. The bad thing about having it on the Kobo is that because it's a compilation of all of the books in one file, I don't know what page or percentage I'm on in a given book, so like, bear with me. I can tell you I am halfway through part one of Interview with the Vampire, which is the first book of the series, and when I'm reading it and comparing it to the show, I do think the show is far superior, and I know that's slightly blasphemous to say because this is the source material, this is what created the show, but I will say, when I disconnect my brain from my memories of the show and just read this as a book, this book is still very good. I just really appreciate the changes they made in the show and how those changes like fundamentally change the plot. In the book so far everyone who has been introduced is white and not only is Louis white but he is a French white plantation owner. So he kind of loses a lot of his depth and, and in my opinion, a lot of empathy from me because he owns people in the book. Other important things of note, important different things from the show and the book is that so far in the book, it almost feels like Lestat chose Louis at random or because he wanted access to Louis' plantation. Whereas in the show, there's more attention to their romantic relationship and Lestat was literally courting Louis before he turned him into a vampire. Um, and because of that, there was more emphasis on Lestat kind of showing him the ropes of becoming a vampire and almost romanticizing the life of a vampire because it's not just the life of a vampire, it's, the, it's a new life with Lestat. In the book, where we're at right now, Lestat changed Louis and is almost like reluctant to show him how to be a vampire and is almost um, dismissive of all of his questions and honestly almost seems kind of bothered. And it almost feels like, well then why did you do that? Why did you basically ruin this person's life if you don't even want to spend time with them? I do hope that we get a little, a little more of those details um, that really made the show special. And I am actively working on separating my brain from the show as I'm picking up this book. So what is Interview with the Vampire? Great question. I'm gonna be honest with you, I did this intro clip the other day and I realized I never actually talked about the plot of the book. I just started talking about the TV show for 15 minutes and I'm gonna remedy that in this new intro clip. Interview with the Vampire follows the vampire Louis Dupont du Lac. He is telling a young journalist his story and how he became a vampire and how he lives as a vampire, etc., etc. I'm like halfway through part one in this book and at that at that point we have met Lestat. Lestat is another vampire. He is the one who turned Louis into a vampire. He is his maker, he is his master, he is whatever title you want to give him. The thing that confuses me about book Louis and book Lestat is that they don't seem to like each other all that much. So they're fighting constantly and Louis is finally at his limit and he's ready to leave Lestat. He's like, surely there are other vampires out there or at the very worst, I can figure this out on my own, but I'm, I'm so donezo. And to ensure that Louis does not leave him, Lestat turns a little girl, Claudia. Now she's part of the family and now Louis feels obligated to stay because he doesn't want to leave this young girl under the control, the influence, the power of Lestat. He wants to like raise this girl right. Because the other thing about Louis is that he's not like other vampires. He doesn't want to eat people. When he turned into a vampire, rather than feeling superior to mortals, he instead uh, found the beauty of mortality. So he really values human life. Whereas Lestat kind of views humans as snacks. So Louis is like, I'm gonna stick around and I'm gonna teach this girl to 
see the beauty of humanity. It's not working out super well for him, but he's trying. And so with the knowledge that I have about the show, I do know things are gonna sour pretty quickly. However, I don't even think my knowledge of the show is that helpful because again, there's so much discrepancies between what is depicted in the show and what I'm reading right now, which is kind of weird. I do know that I have a pretty jam-packed weekend, so I don't know how much progress I'll be able to make, but hopefully I'll be able to make some progress. And um, we'll check in and uh, it'll be very sexy, fun, cool. I'm making a huge mess trying to sort out this lighting and so I think I'm gonna give up. We are on part three of Interview with a Vampire and so much has happened. So much has happened. I think where I left you, they had just turned Claudia and she had just joined the family. I don't know if I mentioned that Claudia is a five-year-old girl and now she is perpetually a five-year-old girl even though her mind continues to grow. As her mind continues to grow and age and develop, she's kind of sick of her situation and she kind of hates Lestat and so she takes it upon herself to free her and Louis from Lestat and by doing that she must kill him and she does that however she doesn't totally do that she thinks she does that and she thinks that they're finally free and then Lestat comes back and he's like you thought you knew how to kill a vampire you guys don't know anything and now I'm gonna punish you guys and so there's a huge fight scene it was so stressful to read and I read that like two days ago and I had to put the book down and kind of like regroup but yesterday I went on a little day trip with my work bestie so I took my kindle with me to read on the commute and sped through part two and halfway through part three. Basically what happens is that after the fight scene, they kill Lestat again and Louis and Claudia go to Europe because Claudia is really interested in meeting other vampires and she's been reading a lot of lore and stories and whatever and she's like all of these stories originate in Europe we have to go there we have to find our people all of the vampires that they've met so far have been like almost zombie creatures they're kind of just like mindlessly attacking people and eating them and they don't have language anymore and their body is rotting disheartened discouraged upset they decide to move on from this quest and go to Paris. And so that's where we're at. And this is conveniently exactly where season two is at. I'm like catching up to what little I already know of season two and also about to head into totally new territory, which is really exciting. I feel like a lot of the book so far has just been like a friendly refresher. I don't know if I've already mentioned, I'm so excited to read Armand's book. I think he might be one of my favorite characters and I know what he does. And I still think that he's my little guy because he does a lot of things and he has a lot of different masks in order to keep what he has. And I think that's really interesting as a character. So I'm excited. So not to sound like Louis and the third part of Interview with the Vampire, but there's this vampire Armand. And yes, he killed my daughter, sister, the only thing I ever cared about. But also he's really smart. He's really powerful. He has big brown eyes and wavy dark hair. So like, I'm just a man. I'm simply just a man. So this is my way of telling you I finished Interview with the Vampire. I ended up giving it four stars. One of the things I really enjoyed about this book is how much we went into Louis and Claudia's relationship. Like the book is broken up into four parts. The first and fourth part are really small and those parts kind of focus most on Louis's relationship with Lestat and Armand respectively. And then part two and three were all about Louis and Claudia and those parts were like three times the size of part one and part four. And I think that just really shows that although he wasn't the greatest parent, friend, brother, uncle, he still feels a lot of love and care and guilt for what happened to her. So if it's not clear, Claudia did not make it at the end of the book. Claudia was killed. And for reasons that I don't totally agree with because there's one law in vampire land and that is you cannot kill your maker. Claudia and Louis tried to kill Lestat they presumably killed him in a house fire. They run away to Europe. They meet Armand. They join a theater. It's all well and good. Then Lestat shows up and he's like, hey, vampires, this little girl broke your one law. She tried to kill me. And so then she gets punished. But I would argue she didn't need to be punished at all because Lestat was right there. Like, did she try to kill him? Sure. 
but she didn't succeed. So like, she's not a murderer. If I was there, I would have been Claudia's lawyer and I would have got her home safe and free. Justice for Claudia. Because she got involved in all of Louis's like messy relationship shit when she was just trying to live her life. So the real villain is Louis. And his crime is being far too beautiful that every man he meets would kill for him. That's just pretty privilege, I guess. So I have started book two, The Vampire Lestat, and Lestat, no surprises here, kind of insufferable. Because like the first three pages of the book, I kid you not, is just Lestat describing himself. And he's like, I'm six foot one, and I have long, thick, blonde hair, a strong jawline, and a button nose. And some people would argue that my lips are too big for my face, but I would argue that my lips are always in a cute little pout and that's actually really sexy and cool of me. Reading those first couple of paragraphs, I was like, oh, I'm gonna need the audiobook. I can't be in this man's mind without some help. I'm on chapter five and the reason why he decided to tell his story is because he's petty as hell and he found out that Louis shared his life story in a international bestseller book called Interview with the Vampire that we just read together. And Lestat was pissed because he didn't like Louis' depiction of him. So he was like, well, now I have no choice but to write my own book. It is such a ridiculous premise to a book, but here we are, stuck in Lestat's dark, twisted fantasy mind. So we're currently in like the 1700s. Lestat is kind of a brute in a lot of ways, but he's not a brute by choice. He's a brute by survival. So he's like the hunter. He like kills animals and feeds his family and fights wolves and whatever. But his real passion is theater and the arts and music. He has a little bit of a Troy Bolton thing going on, you know? And I'm complaining about Lestat as a character because I think he's annoying, but I am enjoying the book so far. The tone is wildly different from Interview with the Vampire, and I like that because each book from my understanding, is told by a different vampire. And each vampire has their own experiences, their own voice, their own like vibe. So I think it's kind of neat that Anne Rice is able to tell a story in the same universe, but like have such distinct voices for each person. Very cool. This is the same day as my previous update. I'm just wearing a sweater now because I got a little cold. I'm currently on part two chapter five of the vampire Lestat. And at this point in the book, Lestat has left his small village. He moved to Paris with his boyfriend, Nicholas, and they joined a theater group. Lestat is living his best life. He is an actor, he's in the theater world, and he's very popular because he's very good at what he does. In being very good at what he does, he gains the attention of Magnus, who is a vampire. Magnus pursues him, he turns him into a vampire, and now you're all caught up. Now that Lestat is a vampire, I feel like I have to formally apologize to him. I know he's a fictional character, just like bear with me, we're in a fantasy world. Um, in this video because I don't know if I said it out loud here, but internally I was giving him a lot of shit for being such a bad vampire teacher and it turns out He's a shitty teacher because he had a shitty teacher Magnus straight up turns him into a vampire and then is basically like hey, I'm gonna go on a trip I'm leaving um, see you in 15 or maybe not. In the case that I don't come back, just need you to know that you're a vampire now. You drink blood. Don't drink blood from dead people or sick people because that's gonna mess you up. Only drink blood from healthy people and uh, stay out of the sun. And I think that covers everything and I'm gonna go. Lestat has gone through this really traumatizing, life altering experience and Magnus is just like, and so now it makes sense why Lestat is the way that he is um, because he had to learn how to be a vampire with nothing. And so it must feel so frustrating to experience people asking all these questions when he's like, I had to do it with nothing. You can do it with nothing as well. It's a trauma response. And now I'm starting to empathize with Lestat just a little bit more than I was at the beginning of this. Hi, this is another apology video to the vampire Lestat. I thought that his maker just dipped for five minutes. And then I started chapter five and it sounded a little more serious than a five minute walk. And so I reread chapter four. Um, his maker didn't just say, hey, I'll be back in 15, see you later, good luck. 
This guy turned Lestat into a vampire and then proceeded to light himself on fire. So that's like super wild. I unfortunately haven't been able to make much more progress today. And if I'm being totally real with you, I'm actually in the middle of a webinar, but we're currently on break. So I just wanted to jump in and say, Lestat, sweetie, I am so sorry. I'm not saying this is justifying your behavior later in life, but like, oh baby. That's rough. Guess who got a lot of reading done this morning? This guy. Why, you may ask? Because I don't know what to wear today. And so I've spent the entire morning just listening to the audiobook as I stare into my closet and try on outfit after outfit after outfit. And this isn't even the final result because I don't really like what I'm wearing right now. I'm overthinking it and now this feels like a bad choice. And the reason why I'm struggling so much today with getting an outfit together is because I have lunch with my work grandmas later today and I just never know how to dress around them. I wanna dress more modestly around them. However, the only modest clothes that I have are like my work clothes. And I don't wanna show up to the function like in my work clothes. That feels like very formal because this is a very casual lunch. However, the only like modest casual clothes I have are like Halloween t-shirts. And I don't wanna show up in that either. But we made it to part three, chapter seven, baby. And a lot has happened. And I have to do another Listat apology video because um, halfway through part two, I realized Lestat is me. I am he. He is they. It has come to my attention that Lestat is a baby sibling who has been inappropriately diagnosed as the eldest daughter, which means that although he is the baby sibling and should have baby sibling privilege, instead he has all of the responsibilities and all of the stress and all of the expectations of an eldest daughter. And we've already talked about this because as a child, Lestat was always the hunter of his family. So he was providing the food, providing the fur, providing the money for his family. And when he becomes a vampire, he gets into a lot of wealth from his maker. And with all of this wealth, he continues to provide for his family. Eventually his mother gets sick with consumption and she goes to Paris to try and track him down. His mother realizes that Lestat is no longer human and Lestat realizes that his mother is not gonna make it by the end of the night. Like she's straight up on her deathbed and he turns her into a vampire. And you would think, oh, now they're both equals. Now they're both, you know, hanging out, being vampires, doing what vampires do. But actually in turning her into a vampire, it only solidifies Lestat eldest daughter syndrome because he has always been responsible over his family but now he is his mother's parent guardian teacher and that's very scary to list at so he's like really overbearing over parenting his mother and his mother kind of hates that and his mother kind of wants to just like live her life especially with this newfound freedom so there's a lot of tension between them but it's just like wow Lestat I have been looking at you the wrong way I thought you were just an asshole and it turns out that you are an asshole baby sibling with a lot of trauma and I see you I will also add a little footnote a little asterisk a little however because Lestat can get a little weird about his mom in a way that I very much don't agree with because it takes Lestat less than 24 hours to start calling his mom um, lover. And I said, now hold on, where are we going with this Anne Rice? So I actually had to pause reading and turn to Google to kind of like see to what extent does lover mean to Lestat when he's referring to his mom. Turns out, fortunately, it doesn't go very far. Still hate it, but at least it doesn't get worse than that. Also, our boy Armand is back. Basically what has happened is that Lestat and Gabrielle, his mother, have been kind of messing around, not like that, just kind of like breaking into people's houses, killing people, stealing their jewels. And so Armand and his coven have been kind of lurking and have been kind of watching Lestat this whole time. And we finally got to a point where they are ready to confront Lestat and his mother. The biggest problem that Armand and his coven have with them is that they are breaking into churches because his coven were under the impression that they could not mess around with religious imagery. To see Lestat and his mother break into cathedrals and like steal gold from like the house of God is super jarring to them. And it could mean one of two things. Either the coven has been lied to this whole time or that Lestat and Gabrielle are an entirely new, different thing and they don't know how to work with that. So I'm gonna try on at least five more outfits 
I'm gonna get at least an hour more into this book and we'll reconnect later. This is my new outfit of the day. Here it is. I think it's the perfect balance of like modest and casual because this is a shirt that I wear <laughs> to work often and the shorts are just denim shorts. So I'm feeling good. I'm feeling confident. I'm feeling ready for grandma lunch. Second update is that we are on part four of the vampire Lestat. Don't really have a lot more to share. It, it's just more of Armand and Lestat like getting to know each other. But like my gripe is that we're on part four and we're only like 30% of the way through the story. Why does Lestat have so much to say? And I'm not being a hater or I'm trying not to be because me and Lestat are kindred spirits now. But like, dude, what the fuck? How do you have so much to say about like a week in your life? Every time I feel like I'm making progress, I like check the percentage and I'm like, oh, we've moved 2%. Especially in comparison to Interview with the Vampire, like Louis, he was getting to the point. He was jumping from place to place. He was glossing over details. He was only talking about the things that matter to him. And is that a reliable narrator? No, but that is a concise, straight to the point, cool guy. And meanwhile, Lestat, still an unreliable narrator, is just like really going at it, talking about his mom's legs for five pages. Like, come on, dude, let's focus here. So that's my update. What is there to say except my man loves to yap? Oh, Lestat, my best friend, my kindred spirit, my twin. Why do you have so much to say all the time? I want to remind you that there are seven parts to this book, but I made it to part five and we are not yet at the 50% mark. We're just under 48, baby. And I don't want to make it sound like all Lestat does is talk about his hair, his outfits, his, his luxuries, his house and his mom because actual plot has happened. But at the same time, I feel like we could focus less on the velvet coats and more on like the actual memory. But you know what? Everyone remembers things differently. Like some people are more sensory that way and um, I need to stop being mean to my boy. And I don't know if we talked about Nikki in a very long time, but Nikki found out that Lestat was a vampire and Lestat, thinking that vampirism is such a gift, wanted to bestow it to Nikki as well. And so he does, and it goes really bad because Nikki is not about that vampire lifestyle. And he actually becomes very depressed because he's no longer human and he becomes almost like statuesque in a lot of ways. Thinking back to the first book, I think this is another huge reason why Louis and Lestat were always at odds with each other because Louis was Lestat's second chance at companionship akin to his relationship with Nikki. And both times, these new vampires do not latch on to the vampirism lifestyle as easily as Lestat expected them to. And so it's just like interesting to see Lestat kind of stuck in these cycles that he has created for himself. And so like Lestat is kind of dealing with that for a long time, but that is until uh, he finds Nikki back at the theater that Lestat used to own and reunites Nikki with his, his violin and he's playing music again. And then in like a, a moment of passion, Nikki like, renames this theater the theater of the vampires which in the first book is where louis meets armand for the first time so it's really cool to see how everything kind of comes together in this series vampirism is such an exclusive group and because it's such an exclusive group it's also such a small world and there are so many like intersections between relationships and places and things and that's just really fun for me it's the drama it's the messiness of it all and so complaining about Lestat forever because he talks too much, but also really having a good time. Hi, friends. We have two new little guys to add to my little guy collection. If it's not obvious at this point in the vlog, the two little guys are Armand and Lestat. Are they morally gray? Are they murderers? Are they manipulative? Are they a lot of bad things? Yes, but they're also deeply insecure, which means that they have access to my little guy collection. Armand what has always been an honorary member of my little guy club. Ever since I started watching the show and ever since I saw like a behind the scenes clip of um, Asad Zaman, I think is his name, the actor who plays Armand, 
um, talking about how deeply insecure Armand is and how he wears so many masks because he's playing so many roles so that he is accepted and loved by whoever he wants to be accepted and loved by. And I was like, this is fascinating. And I need more of this little guy. And I want to put him in a box and I want to study him like a little bug. So in part five of the Vampire Lestat, we get a little bit of Armand's origin story. And we learn that he was subjected to sex trafficking and he caught the interest of Marius, who is like one of the old olds, like one of the original vampires maybe. So Marius turns Armand and then Marius kind of just leaves him. And ever since then, Armand has been kind of like seeking out the attention, the guidance of something, someone. However, unfortunately, because he is one of the oldest vampires, in turn, a lot of younger vampires revere Armand and seek him for guidance. And so um, while Lestat and Armand are like butting heads, Lestat destroys Armand's original coven and Armand reaches out to Lestat one last time and Lestat thinks this is going to end in violence and he's like mentally preparing himself to fight this little guy and instead Armand kind of just like falls to his knees and he's like please love me like I will be whoever you want me to be and don't abandon me like everyone else has abandoned me in my 500 years of life oh my god Armand you little freaking guy. You are one of the most powerful guys out there begging for someone to love him. That is so good. Like Anne Rice, I wanna study you like a bug. So all to say, Armand is now officially in the little guy collection. Lestat also part of the little guy collection because all his life Lestat has been taking care of other people. And more than anything, he has wanted someone to take care of him, but he can't put down his walls to let that happen. And the people that he wants to care for him don't actually really care for him, at least not in the way that he wants them to. And in that case, I'm speaking of Gabrielle. He so desperately wants this like mother-son dynamic duo kind of situation, but Gabrielle so desperately wants to finally just be left alone. When they're having their final moment together, Lestat says this one line, you sense my loneliness, my bitterness at being shut out of life, my bitterness that I'm evil, that I don't deserve to be loved and yet I I need love hungrily. As you said yourself once, I am very good at being what I am, which is to say evil, which is to say monster, which is to say Frankenstein coded. So that's where I'm at, just me and my collection of sad little guys. And to be honest, I couldn't be more thrilled, but I still got a ways to go with this book. Could not finish it this weekend, but like for real, I have to finish it this week. And I'm really excited now that we're entering the New Orleans era of his life to really see his point of view of when he met Louis and their whole dynamic and maybe mentions of Claudia. I don't know how far Lestat is gonna delve into that portion of his life, but I guess we just have to like continue reading to see. I did finish the Vampire Lestat. I, mm, I did technically finish the Vampire Lestat. I was listening to the last like two chapters on audiobook last night. Did I fall asleep? Yes. Do I remember what happened in those last two chapters? No. Am I going back? No. I don't feel like it. He was just talking about his record deal because um, what you don't know, or maybe we talked about this. After Louis had his memoir published, Lestat was upset and he decided to write his own story which results in the book The Vampire Lestat and he said not only am I going to write a book I'm going to be a rock star so that people are actually interested in picking up this book and so that's exactly what he did. So yeah the last couple of chapters were just him about his like record deal and like all of the intricacies of being like a Hollywood starlet. <laughs> I don't know I didn't read it but I'm going to count it as a win and I'm going to count it as finished. I think overall I'm going to give The Vampire Lestat three and a half stars because I enjoyed it. It was interesting. It was engaging until it wasn't and until it was a touch too long for me because this book is about the vampire Lestat, but it's also about all of the vampires he meets along the way. I think we talked about Armand because we're always going to talk about Armand, but like Armand has his own section of this book like a good three to four chapters about his origin story and his life as it intersects with Lestat. At another point Lestat meets Armand's maker Marius and we get a whole section where Lestat is essentially Marius's sugar baby for the summer and as Lestat is sugar babying it up he also learns more about not only Marius's story but also like the vampire history that exists. The Marius story 
very long, but like to the point where I was listening to it in audiobook and I couldn't tell whether we were back in Lestat's point of view or still in Marius's point of view. Like it was a significant portion of the book. So much so that I feel like Marius's story could have warranted being its own novella rather than being a 75 page portion of Lestat's story. In a way, I understand why that is because it's a lot of world building. It's a lot of like vampire history. It's a lot of laying down the groundwork. And maybe, you know, Anne Rice didn't know that this was gonna continue to be such a hit. Like maybe she didn't know that she was going to end up writing 13 books. And so she was like, well, this is my second chance. This might be my only chance. Let me tack on as much information as I can. I don't know, I wasn't there, but within the Marius section, within the, the hot girl summer section of Lestat's story, we also learn a lot about the original vampire and how the longer you live as a vampire, like the more statuesque you become because there are two vampires in particular, um, Akasha and uh, question mark, because I don't remember his name. And they are suspected to be the first vampires. And at this point in their life, they appear to be marble statues. So Lestat meets these two vampires and he has a connection with Akasha because Lestat is very much an it girl. And so every person, every vampire, everything he meets is immediately enamored by him because he's six foot one with long wavy blonde hair. So he has had a connection with Miss Akasha. He gets into like some marital drama between Akasha and the other guy. And so that's the reason why he goes to New Orleans. Um, so we read like 400 pages of Lestat's origin story. We read 400 pages of his hot girl summer 400 pages of his outfit of the days, his wavy hair, his hot mom. And then we have like exactly 25 pages about his time in New Orleans, which I think is hilarious because the very reason he sat down to write his story was to correct the wrongs that Louis did in Interview with the Vampire. And then when we actually get to New Orleans, he's kind of just like, yeah, um, Louis already wrote about this and he was wrong, but I'm gonna just let him have it. And then he moves on to his record deal. I think that's amazing. I think that's hilarious. But I can also admit Lestat is kind of a lot as a character. So while I'm giving this three and a half stars and while I'm interested in continuing this series, I think we're gonna call it quits for this part of the series. I do think I need a break from Lestat. And from what I understand of the series, Lestat becomes kind of like a primary character throughout the books. And like throughout this vlog, I've kind of flipped back and forth between liking the guy and being extremely exhausted about the very name Lestat. And I stand by that. I like the guy and I find him so annoying. Do I want to continue his story? Sure. Do I need a break? Desperately so. <laughs> this is it for now. I'm gonna read some other books to kind of cleanse my palate and then we'll pick up Queen of the Damned and The Body Snatcher, The Body Thief in the next vlog. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you have a great day and I'll see you in the next Lestat vlog.